Welcome to the Off the Charts podcast. I'm Matt Manicherian, joined by Nathan Cooper and John Todd, both of whom are lead scouts on the SIS Football Rookie Handbook. Coop, it's been a few weeks since we've had you back on the show. Welcome back. What was your biggest takeaway from the four games? Yeah, I think how fun and competitive the NFC West is going to be this season and how it has, you know, over the first four weeks. We thought the Rams were the front runners going into last week. Arizona came out and took it to them a little bit. That Seattle-San Francisco game was a good one. And now we get consecutive weeks of, of NFC West matchups. We have the Rams and Seahawks tonight uh, and then Niners-Cardinals on, on Sunday. So I think it's going to be a fun year watching these teams battle it out and, and see who comes out on top. Yep. Mark Simon asked me a few weeks ago if I thought they could all make the playoffs. I said absolutely not. But here we are. And when you look at it, the, all four teams in the division are in the top half of the league in total points. The 49ers are 15th. The Seahawks are 12th. The Rams are tied for fourth. And the Cardinals are number one. John, what was your biggest takeaway from week four? Yeah, the NFC West cannibalism begins. For me, it was the Dallas Cowboys seem like legit contenders. Week one battle with the Bucks, obviously, then close win against a good Chargers team, dominated the Eagles. And then this past week, beating the unbeaten Panthers after a huge third quarter. So statistically, the Cowboys are in the top 10 in passing, rushing, and pass defense, EPA, offensive line points earned, and pass rush points saved. That's every phase but run defense, really. That's their only lower rated phase right now. They've proven they can win with Dak's arm, with Zeke and Pollard's legs, and a low scoring game and shootouts. Trayvon Diggs won't stop getting interceptions. They're doing all this without Michael Gallup, Demarcus Lawrence, Lyle Collins. And then they got the, the Giants this week and then the Patriots the week after that, right before their bye. So we'll see if there's a letdown spot to come or if they can confirm that they belong in this upper echelon of contenders. Yeah, they should continue just floating through that division, especially on the strength of their number two ranked offense. And I think you brought it up for the first time today, but it's going to come up and be a sort of recurring theme that comes up throughout the day. The lack of emphasis on run defense in the NFL right now, especially on, on some of the better teams that we're looking at and the true contenders, the Cowboys are the first one where it comes up when you look at on defense, they've been performing pretty well in the past game, but it's been that run defense that's kind of been been their weakest unit. And as much as football coaches hate to say it, like historically, you want to be able to stop the run. If you have to choose one unit, uh, you know, your passing offense, rushing offense, pass defense, rush defense, if you have to choose one unit that you could struggle in a little bit in the modern NFL, I'm not saying it would work in high school or college football, but in the modern NFL, I, I think you might choose run defense. So something to keep an eye on there. So let's get right into the biggest games of last week. First one, biggest one, the Cardinals against the Rams. It was number one against number two in total points coming into the week. John, we discussed the numbers coming into last week. Even though both of us liked the Rams a little bit, the Cardinals had some, some compelling statistical points, including their number two ranking on total points on defense on the strength of a number one pass rush unit. That might have had something to it looking ahead into that game. Yeah, for sure. We knew it'd be a competitive game. I kind of figured that the Rams would win, but I, I figured that the Cardinals would still be in the mix all year. We, we knew they were a good team. Flip the other way. Yeah, they look great. The running back tandem I talked about last week worked as intended. Edmonds put up 120 yards in the middle of the field, and then James Conner had two touchdowns in short yardage. But overall, it really seemed like the offensive game plan was clearly to distribute the ball and attack the Rams from different angles. The Cardinals had four different players with multiple carries and six different players with multiple pass catches in the first half alone. So that's when your game plan is being established. Obviously, in the second half, they get a lot more run heavy to run out the clock and everything. But that first half, they had 10 guys with multiple touches. So they really distributed it all around. Can we unpack that real quick, John? I want to just unpack that. Yeah, sure. Because. When you talk about Cliff Kingsbury and you talk about the offense that he's running, you certainly think one of the one of the forefathers of, of the spread game in general, Mike Leach, and what he likes to do. When Mike Leach talks about balance, he doesn't talk about balance being 50% run, 50% pass. He talks about it being 20% this player getting the ball, 20% this player getting the ball, 20%. That, if all of your skill players are getting the ball 20% of the time, that's balance. I think that's exactly what you're saying about the, the way that they tried to attack the Rams. Yeah, it doesn't matter how they get there. Of the four guys with multiple carries, two of them are to Rondell Moore. Obviously, they're getting guys in the slot. The one guy that didn't have multiple touches was Christian Kirk, who's been doing a great job this year as an inside receiver bumping inside and, and one of their inside receivers in the air raid there, kind of a, a position change. But yeah, they really distributed around. That was definitely their game plan. And then up front, they schemed up their protections to have the edges beat them and not Aaron Donald, which is what we talked about, which definitely happened a few times. Donald did get a few sacks for the perimeter, guys, but they clearly liked Kyler's chances against the edge pressure better than pressure up the middle. Yeah, you talked about Edmonds a little bit, and he's a guy that I actually liked coming out a few, a few years ago. I, I, it's been nice to see him get a little bit of an opportunity. I like what he does in the run game. He can also be a, a receiver, like you said. 
and, and he's been a little bit of a surprise for him. So I definitely like what he's been doing. Kyler was my surprise pick going into week one, and he hasn't dis- disappointed yet this year. The team they've they've assembled, like you guys mentioned, it's, it's come together perfectly. I'm definitely surprised that they came out and shut the Rams down like they did, especially early in the game. Stafford didn't look like the Stafford from the first three weeks. A couple of weeks before that, he he looked like he was slow getting out of the gates, you know, finally settling in, you know, that second quarter into the second half. Didn't really do that uh, against the Cardinals defense. I see them bouncing back, though. I think the, the Rams are definitely good enough to still stick around and, and be one of those top end teams. I think they strolled through those first three weeks. They, this was a little bit of a wake up call for them, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I can't wait to see how that division race shakes out as we go forward. All right, let's move forward to Sunday night. It was the game everybody talked about, Brady versus Belichick. Everybody looked forward to it. What were your guys' takeaways from that game? Nathan, you go first. Yeah, Mac Jones looks like the quarterback of the future for New England. And Tom Brady looked, looked like he struggled a little bit. The big thing coming in was obviously the Brady-Patriots reunion. Brady breaking the uh, the yards record. You know, those are big storylines and everything. But I think my biggest takeaway is, is how banged up that Buccaneers defense is now, uh, especially the secondary. That was a top two or three defense coming into the end of the season. Really liked them all around. And now I'm a little worried that they're even going to be a top 10 defense at least these next few weeks until some of these guys get back. You know, Mac Jones average throw depth was just over five yards this last week. Uh, and that was the bottom of, of any quarterback in, in the league last week. So I think against a, a team that was pushing it down the, or that could push it down the field against a quarterback that would try to, to push the ball down the field a little bit, I think the outcome would have been different. I don't think the Buccaneers probably won win that game, you know, if that's the case. But Brady and the offense, they need to play better than they did on Sunday night, uh, especially to overcome some of these missing pieces on the on the defensive side. Yeah, I agree with Coop. The Bucs just weren't in sync offensively. It was one of those nights that it wasn't the comfortable win I expected. They still found a way to get it done, but Brady was off target more than usual downfield. When he did drop in some perfect balls, he had the Antonio Brown drop in the end zone. Weather was probably a factor for a lot of that, but it just wasn't a clean, smooth game that you normally see from him. On the other side of things, the Patriots running game just keeps declining. They've had fewer rushing yardage totals each week going down to franchise low on Sunday, negative one total rushing yards this past week. So it's really surprising coming into the season, off season, preseason, everything. They had all the elements of finding this identity as a, a really heavy ground and pound football team. And they've really gone away from that. Had a tough string of games in the past few weeks that have taken them out of their game flow. They'll probably get back to that this week against the Texans, I would assume. But yeah, like Coop said, we got Alabama Mac Jones on Sunday night. He had the 19 straight completions. That interior pressure that I, that I talked about last week with Devin White coming up the middle, he forced that early interception. But then as the game progressed, he became so unfazed by those blitzes that, that were getting thrown at him that the Bucks had to play back. They had to play it straight back off, stop calling all those blitzes and and play it straight up, which almost burned them because of how, how depleted their secondary is right now. So slugfest in the rain from the mid quarter, mid third quarter on, we got points on every drive. So it was a Mac and Brady shot for shot. Mac looking a little young Brady ish, the play action fakes, the, the really executing all that stuff. If you squint hard enough, it, it, he looked really good. So really encouraging performance from him in a big moment early in his career. Yeah. Well, if you remember that Brady wasn't that good early in his career, he's been better in his forties than he was in his twenties that, you know, that'll also play into it. Mac Jones, I, I don't think you're, you're wrong at all in terms of his ability to process, get the ball out of his hands. Yeah. It's a little bit of like think and dunk all over the place, but that's what that offense has been for a long time especially when they don't have the vertical targets. I was anticipating just like a lot of split safety stuff from, from Belichick coming at Brady. And in actuality, it's like 47 dropbacks, something like that, just eight of them with split safety schemes. So for as much as I was anticipating that, uh, Belichick definitely mixed it up and he kind of leaned on the, the middle of the field close stuff a little bit more than I would have anticipated if you, if you had told me coming into the game. One other thing I wanted to talk about in this game People asked me a bunch about the decision at the kick at the end of the game. I wanted to hear what you guys thought about that because I understand the criticism. Obviously, he missed the kick. If he makes the kick, you still have Brady getting the ball back and too much time on the clock. But I didn't find it to be an egregious decision at all. I think this is one of those where you think if your kicker can make it, then you kick the ball from there. If, if you don't think he can make it, then, then you got to go for it. I, I didn't think it was like just stupid to kick in that situation. I don't, did either of you guys have a, a differing view on that? No, no, I, I thought it was fine. And it's one of those things where he had the distance. That's kind of your big question when when you got the, the weather factor there. It's a long kick. The fact that he got it there and he just missed it, then, then that's kind of all you can hope for. So go with the game flow. You're obviously underdogs. It was a, it's a low scoring game. Take a shot there. I didn't have a big issue with it. 
Yeah, Nick Folk's one of those guys that he's been through these situations. He, you know, he's a guy that can make that kick. You know, they they kept talking, every, you know, throughout the entire uh, part of the game where, you know, his plant leg, is his plant leg okay to make a kick like that in the rain and, and everything? And and like John said, you know, it, it made it there. It just, you know, unfortunate off the cross or off the uh, the upright there. I, I didn't have an issue with it. I think that's probably the decision I would have gone with. And And you probably do leave Brady enough time to come back, but the way that, the entire game was going in the game flow of, of the game. It's possible that he comes down and gets a field goal, but the rain started picking back up and there's a chance that your defense can hold up there. So I uh, definitely don't have an issue with it. All right. We're all in agreement. Let's move forward to Monday night. Keep it moving. The Chargers beat the Raiders. That really good AFC West as well. Justin Herbert hasn't been statistically outrageous like he was last year, but the eye test is looking pretty strong and not for nothing. He's fifth in total points behind Number one, Patrick Mahomes. Number two, Tom Brady. Number three, Lamar Jackson. And number four, Matthew Stafford. So he's been playing pretty well. Meanwhile, Derek Carr on the other side of things finally showed a little bit of chinks in his armor. Went under the pressure of that Chargers defense, which has always been the question with Carr. Where do you guys stand on how you evaluate these two quarterbacks? Yeah, I still like both of them. Herbert still has those rookie moments at times, which, you know, makes sense. But I like what's around him. I, I like the decisions he's making. I like that, you know, they have a strong run game. They, they have that balance in, in, you know, all the areas like we talked about earlier. Strong weapons through the air. The offensive line has been playing pretty well for the most part, keeping him pretty clean. I think he's going to be a, a guy that's going to ascend into that top 10 quarterback in the league discussion by the end of the season. Last year, he came out and just hair on fire, played really well, and, and I think better than a lot of people thought. And, you know, I think he's really starting to take that and keeping on improving into his second season. So I think he's playing really well, and I think he's going to be up there by the end of the year. And and on the other side, he might uh, be there, man. I think he might be there. <laughs> he, I got to say. Getting, He's getting close. Absolutely. You know, I, I, I like the, the direction he's in for sure. And, and that team, you know, that team's a, a solid team to contend. So I like it. And looking on the other side, Derek Carr, to me, it didn't seem like there was really much he could do. That offensive line was under siege, you know, from the start. That Chargers pass rush was all over and all night. And like Joey Bosa said, you know, Carr is kind of a change quarterback when he gets under pressure, as are most quarterbacks. Carr needs to be uh, obviously better under pressure, but that offensive line needs to get it together moving forward. If they want to play in this division, you know, that has a lot of good pass rushing, that offensive line is going to have to step it up. Carr's a solid player, not under pressure. You leave him clean. He's, he's going to going to do some things for you, but you know, get, you get pressure on him. He doesn't necessarily fold a little bit, but he definitely struggles. I mean, I think that's one area he definitely needs to improve on. But like I said, that offensive line really needs to start stepping it up or, or they're going to find, find themselves sort of behind the eight ball there. Yeah, right now that 26th ranked offensive line in terms of total points for the Raiders definitely has been a bit of an Achilles heel. And we've seen uh, maybe a slight regression from from Derek Carr over the last week or two, if you count the the pick six last week against him. We'll be keeping an eye on him throughout the year, but I'm kind of with you guys. I think both those guys are are players that I'd like to compete with, especially if I had a, a Mahomes that I had to go up against. John, what else stood out to you from that game? Yeah, off of that, Leatherwood's been struggling at right tackle. He'll figure it out. I do really like Derek Carr's response to Joey Bosa that that he said, actually, I think you were watching the game in reverse, that he thought that he got more comfortable as the game went on. Obviously, the pressure got to him early, but I just like his charisma and stuff. He feels like he's he's really grown into a leadership role there over the past few years with the Raiders, and, and I think they've got a really good situation with him. But yeah, obviously, the main thing that stood out with me was that unbelievable Hunter Renfro play on the punt. That was as good an individual football play as I've seen in a long time. The football intelligence to identify the uncovered gunner, the instincts to choose to bail from his return position and start sprinting for the open man before the punter's even shown fake. And then the physicality and technique, that that wrapping technique looked better than a lot of safeties do these days. So my jaw dropped. It was just unbelievable winning play. He's It's something that he's kind of become known for. And then obviously, actually for like more football stuff that he's he's used to, the the double whip, the flat China route, whatever you want to call it, that they're calling it these days, that it's just a great route for the touchdown. I saw that piece going around that Cooper Cups kind of co-opted it for the Rams and, and Sean McVay's offense. When defenders are so used to usual footwork and only a certain number of options and breaks that players can take at the stem, it's obvious that Renfro's found something that hasn't clicked with corners yet that, to stay that extra beat patient through. So he's really clicked into something in that end. And then, yeah, the punt return thing was just unbelievable. The way he uses the defender's technique against him, it's like, oh, you studied me? Well, I'm going to make you pay for studying me by by messing with what exactly you're, you're prepared for me to do. So I love that. A uh, word comes to mind that I know Mark would appreciate if he were here. He has a Jeterian way about him. He is that 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 Derek Jeter type of find a way to make a, a winning play, whatever you want to call it. Uh, Renfro does that stuff. 
So definitely something that was crazy to see. Nate, anything you wanted to talk about with this one? Obviously that Renfro play, you know, I didn't even realize that was him at first. I thought it was some safety bailing from his, uh, you know, safety spot. I'm about to drop back into to punt coverage and he gets over there. And, and then I realized that was Renfro is just a crazy play. Like, like John said, awesome to see, but yeah, I, that chargers defense, you know, I don't want to get into it too much here. I think, you know, we're about to talk about this upcoming week. So I'm going to save it for that, but I'm very impressed with the chargers defense going forward. All right. That's a good tease. And we'll be right back. The Sports Info Solutions Injury Risk Model and Application is sweeping the NFL, providing never-before-seen insights to the most cutting-edge teams in the league. If you work for an NFL team as a scout, analyst, coach, trainer, or executive, and you don't have access to the SIS Injury Risk Model and Application, you're missing out on game-changing information that has endless use cases. Our model is tested and calibrated so you can take the guesswork out of injury risk projections and reliably quantify the impact of injury risk on any decisions that you make. This product is exclusively available to NFL teams and it comes with access through both the data feed and an online interface. The model updates on a nightly basis throughout the season to take into account the constantly updating stream of information. If you work for an NFL team and are interested in learning more about the SIS injury risk model and application, please reach out to us at offthecharts at sportsinfosolutions.com. All right, coming right back in, let's look ahead to this weekend's games. Let's talk week five. First one up, Nate teased it before, the Browns against the Chargers. The Browns are number three in total points overall, including 10th on offense and second on defense. The Chargers are seventh overall, including fifth on offense and eighth on defense. Nate, you wanted to talk about that number eight ranked defense. What are you looking forward to in the matchup? Yeah, that Chargers defense. I, I think the Chargers have one of the best defenses in the league when healthy. And, I, and I've thought that the last couple of years. It's just they've been so riddled with injuries. It, it's hard for some of those players. They haven't played together. You talk about the last couple of years, Bosa, Nuosu, Murray, James, Adderley. And now you add in a guy like Asante Samuel. Those guys have barely played any games together. You put those guys together when healthy, those guys, you know, those guys are game changers. You know, you get all those guys on the field, they're forced to be reckoned with. Murray's going on IR. So now it's a, yet another injury that some more games that they're going to have to play with uh, out of all of those guys together. But, you know, whether it's pass rush, whether it's, you know, in coverage, different, you know, facets of the game, I really like that Chargers defense. And, and I think it's going to be an interesting game going up against a good rushing attack, Nick Chubb, Kareem Hunt on the, on the Brown side. It's definitely going to be a fun one to watch. And, you know, you mentioned the, the second rate in total points for the Browns. The Browns have been one team that, you know, they've finally assembled a, a strong core. Three or four years ago when we were looking at, you know, they brought in Odell, they brought in Jack Conklin, they drafted Denzel Ward. We're like, okay, this this team's going to be good. You know, drafted Baker. And finally, I think last year we saw this team finally come around, all the draft picks finally coming in and, and you know, making plays, the free agents finally starting to work. And I think that this team is starting to mesh together really well. So I think this is going to be a really fun matchup. I mean, just looking at what they do, I, I kind of, I think like kind of defensively, not just the players that you talk about who kind of mostly been around for a couple of years, but also the schematic changes that they're making now going from being kind of this, this cover three till I die sort of thing into a defense that's going to mix it up a little bit more. I was just pulling out the stats and, and, and checking out just the number of flip field safety snaps that they've had this year compared to what they've done in years past and, and how that's changed. Um, I'll see if I can, if I can wrap my head around those numbers when John gets into it here. The other thing I was looking at when just looking at their defense is, like I mentioned before, the focus on disrupting the pass game. They're tied for just 25th in run defense total points, but they're sixth in pass rush and seventh in pass coverage. So Brandon Staley's priorities are clear in terms of what they're trying to do here. They're trying to, they're trying to affect that portion of the game. And the Cardinals are a team that's very similar in this regard. They're tied for 25th in run defense with those chargers, but third in pass rush and fifth in coverage. So you're looking at these teams that are playing well right now, and they're marrying their offense and the, and the quarterbacks with these defenses that are more pass focused in the way that they defend teams. Yeah, and off of the, the Brandon Staley thing, obviously that clip going around this week of him talking about what, what the analytics community has been aware of in terms of you don't necessarily need to run the ball in order to have successful play fakes and, and run the play fake game, play action game, all that stuff, talking about the physicality of the game and everything. That's all stuff that, that people have really started to enjoy. Brandon Staley as a, as a coach. He seems to really get like the both of the the personnel side and the analytics side and understanding all that. But for me, I'm an offensive line guy. These O-line D-line matchups are going to be awesome in this game. 
specifically Joey Bosa against mostly Jack Conklin, hopefully some Jedrick Wills as well. And then obviously the big rookie test for Rayshon Slater against Miles Garrett. You got Clowney, you got Tack McKinley. I think a really interesting thing about both of these teams, the Browns and Chargers, they're two of the teams that most philosophically utilize super wide nine techniques in their edge rushers. Bosa and Garrett's get offs, especially they're totally fine sacrificing some distance in terms of that point A to point B aspects. Like they're not starting them at a five tech or anything. They're fine sacrificing the distance because they have such a quick get off and it gives them more runways, more free space to, to get up there, less in chips and everything and a more direct point A to point B rush to the quarterback. So it also puts a lot of pressure on the other side on these tackles to have to vary their pass sets. Guys are going to have to either try to jump them early, do wide sets, or if they're dropping vertical, they have to sit and be patient and wait for a full speed edge rusher to come with a, a truckload of, of tools to move on them. So the Browns passing game really needs to get back on track. You can't do that if you let Bosa wreak havoc all day, especially the news that, that just came out that Baker's been playing with a torn labrum in his left shoulder the past couple of weeks. So they really need to get that going. And then the Browns pass rush for us right now is top five units statistically. And with the eye test, they're top five in pressures for us, type first in sacks in the NFL. The Chargers offensive line might not have the names outside of Slater, but they've played fairly well so far. So this is a really big test for them. Yeah, super interesting. Definitely all eyes on Slater as he has to take on those edge rushers. All right, let's keep it moving forward. Let's talk about another big game this week. The Bills taking on the Chiefs. For me, this would be the favorite for AFC Championship game coming into the season. Is it still that favorite for the AFC Championship game matchup? John, what do you think there? I think it is for me. It's not so much of a sample size from the rest of the AFC teams that have gotten off to hot starts yet. Other than the Bills, you have the AFC North that's gotten off well, and then the rest of the AFC West that are really trying to stake claim there. The Ravens and Chargers have already beaten them. I've said on the pod, I really like this Browns team. Coop talked about this. He likes the Browns too. They maybe should have won that game against them week one. So they've already been tested against the Chiefs. Those would probably be my top three. Then they've got a primetime matchup in Las Vegas in a month from now. So we'll see if the Raiders are still hanging around there. So that would be another one to throw in the mix. Yeah, they'll get some shots at some of those games that, that they've lost to kind of avenge some of those things. It should be interesting. And uh, what about in terms of matchups in this one? Anything that, that you were looking forward to in terms of the game inside the game? Yeah, I think everybody's going to be looking for Tyreek Hill or Travis Kelsey. Those are the two big names in, in the passing game. And obviously, there's kind of been some ups and downs with how they've gotten off this year. Those two guys against Leslie Frazier and, and, and the Bills defense, the Bills defense coordinator there. How are the Bills going to handle those two elite targets? Which one are they going to let get some catches and, and negate the other one? Or how do they want to handle that? Obviously, weeks one and four were massive Tyreek games. Two and three, not so much. Kelsey's been big every week until this past week. That doesn't really matter when the Eagles let Tyreek Hill run wild 40 yards downfield uncovered like they did. So for us, the Bills are our number one pass defense in the NFL right now. They've pitched two shutouts the past three weeks. They're right there with the Raiders at the top of the league in pressures when rushing four or fewer. So that means more guys in coverage to help on the back end. And in theory, personnel-wise, they've got Tremaine Edmonds and Tredavious White as perfect personnel matchups, one-on-one, if you wanted to do that, against Kelsey and Hill. On top of that, they got a great defensive coaching staff schematically. Now it's just about execution. They've got all the pieces there. I, I think this is going to be maybe a lower scoring game than people are expecting, or at least the Bills hope so. Right. If it's going to play into the Bills' hands, they might they might hope for that. Coop, you uh, went back and looked at some of the AFC Championship game last year to see what we could expect based on that one. But what did you see as far as that went? Yeah, looking at that game, I, you know, I feel like Mahomes really got to do whatever he wanted. The Bills defense just couldn't really corral him. John talked about, you know, Hill and Kelsey a little bit. Both of those guys accounted for nearly 300 of the 325 yards that, that Mahomes threw for. They really didn't get a chance to corral him. And I think that's going to be something that they're really going to be focused on. John talked about, you know, Edmonds and, and White. I think those are some of the top guys on that team and in the league, really. And those guys can really match up with them. And when you look on the other side, the Chiefs defense, they sacked Allen four times, picked him off once, and they just made him look uncomfortable. Whenever you're looking this season so far, the Bills offensive line, they've allowed Allen to be pressured the third most in the league already. But the, on the other side, the Chiefs, uh, they're tied for the lowest amount of pre pressures on defense as well. So I'm going to be interested to see which of those uh, units steps up uh, on Sunday and see if that, that Chiefs D can really, in that pass rush, can get to Allen or, uh, you know, that Bills offensive line, if they can step up and and then keep Allen clean because, you know, I think the Bills uh, offense definitely, you know, they have weapons they can put up points and, and keep up with the, the Chiefs for sure. Yeah, it's like based on how the teams have performed so far this year with, with you know, the Chiefs just like scraping up to 500 and the Bills having shut out two teams. Uh, the Bills have been a little bit better. But I mean, looking into this game, I think that like you're saying, it, it's, it's, it'll be a matter to see how those matchups play out. Um, in terms of total points, John, I think you mentioned it. The Bills are first on defense. They're second overall. So they've been outstanding. 
despite the fact that the Chiefs are way down at 18 in the total point standings, I would still give them the nod to be in that favorite to be in the AFC championship game along with the Bills ahead of, like you mentioned, the Browns, the Ravens, the division rivals, and all of those teams are ahead of them in, the, in those total points rankings right now. They're number one in the NFL on offense, the Chiefs, despite the struggles, but number 32 on defense. So they've got to find a way to get back to some semblance of complimentary football, some some way to get the ball turned over to, to just help keep feeding that, that number one offense. Because ultimately, that's the blueprint for them. Yeah, we talked about the, the Cowboys and kind of giving up and sacrificing the run defense a little bit. The Chiefs have been awful against the run. And I think that's one thing that they need to start stopping to, to try and help that, that entire defense for sure. The Chiefs, 32nd against the run, 24th in pass rush, 28th in pass coverage. Got to do something. All right, one more game to talk about. Kind of sneaky good matchup here. The Packers, who are the 11th ranked team by total points, take on the 16th ranked Bengals in a matchup. What should we look out for in this one? Yeah, a couple of three and one teams here. I'm not sure you know people <laughs> thought of that after week one, but on the Bengals side, Jamar Chase looks like a number one receiver for, for the Bengals offense. But for me, the, the big debate, obviously, during the draft was, do we take Chase and kind of pair him back up with Joe Burrow, or do we take an offensive lineman? And I think that was a real debate. Um, that The Bengals offensive line wasn't good last year. It hasn't been good. And, and this year, they haven't given up, given up a ton of pressure, you know, just looking at the raw numbers. But Burrow's been sacked 10 times already, uh, and he's been under duress a lot in key situations. Um, so that offensive line really needs to step up. It, it's definitely a huge help that Burrow's been playing well enough, and they have the, the playmakers on the outside when Higgins is healthy. Chase, obviously, Zoma looked really good last week as kind of a check down and, and dump off and tight end receiver. And, and then those, those running backs as well can kind of do a little bit of everything in the run game and the pass game. So they definitely have the, the weapons, but that offensive line definitely needs to play better. This is another one of those games where you talk about the Packers defensive line. They haven't pressured uh, opponents at a high rate yet. So another matchup where, you know, the, the offensive line hasn't been great, but neither has the defensive line. So we're going to see which unit comes out there. Obviously, you know, we all knew Aaron Rodgers was, was going to turn it around after week one. He wasn't going to play that bad this season. The relax, you know, mantra definitely came into play there. And he's he's going to be uh, a top end quarterback. And, that, and that's how it's going to be throughout the rest of the season, I would think as well. And so I, I think it's going to be interesting to see if the Bengals can keep up honestly, with, with the Packers and with that offense and with Rodgers. Yeah, I was just going to say that Burrow came up clutch last week. They scored on every drive in the second half for that comeback win against the Jaguars. But like Coop just said, they're going to need strong four strong quarters, a, co- a complete game. They had a really good first drive, and then they, they shut down for most of the first half there. They're going to need four strong quarters to keep up with Aaron Rodgers. The Packers aren't facing the Steelers anymore. They, they played them last week. The Steelers just dumped everything down underneath to Deontay Johnson, Najee Harris. Joe Burrow's working to all levels of the field. He likes doing that. He has real perimeter threats, especially if T. Higgins comes back this week. He started practicing again yesterday. Burrow's tied with Justin Herbert right now for second in the league in IQR when throwing at least 15 yards downfield. On the other hand, Joe Barry's Packers are a predominantly zone defense, and they'll throw some heavily disguised looks at you. They'll make things real confusing. And Burroughs had a lot more success this year against man coverages than zone coverages. So if you look at the touchdown interception ratios, just those raw numbers, but there's also a 30 point difference in IQR for us. So we'll see how that shakes out. If he can, if he can kind of figure out the the Packers, what they're throwing at him with zone defenses. And you've also really got to hope Joe Mixon plays. He's one of the league's higher running back snap count rates so far this year. And that's for a reason. Smaji Piran and Chris Evans aren't really the threats that he is in both phases of the game, running and passing. So they're really going to cross their fingers that he got hurt on that last drive of the game last week. Hopefully he can come back and play. Yeah, I think that's that's really interesting, you know, especially with the Packers being kind of poor in run defense. But I keep coming back to with this game and, and with, with everything this week, just that that question of the defensive philosophy being focused on defending the pass versus defending the run. I think with Joe Barry kind of getting his scheme in there, We're seeing the Packers 12th in pass rush, 10th in coverage against being near the bottom of the league in run defense. And now I know Packers fans are still going to say, I can't believe Matt's here telling me that that he thinks that the Packers get it because they just got Rasul Douglas instead of Stephon Gilmore. And and trust me, I don't think Rasul Douglas is going to inspire that kind of confidence like you would in a Packers fan with, with Stephon Gilmore. But over the course of the year, the thing that I'm looking for with Joe Barry's defense, not so different from looking at the Chiefs offensive line with all the new pieces in there is how it gels over the course of the year, how they come along and how they're playing in December, not necessarily being the same thing as as what we saw in September. So they can continue to progress and they can continue to to operate more in a way that that shows that they get it. 
and they understand what those priorities should be in terms of defending the past and making sure that they handle that priority, then I like where they're headed. This would be a fascinating game. If the, if the Bengals come out and win this one, I would have to really take a harder look at them because I haven't been a believer. I haven't been a fan of them being some team that I think has really gotten it. But for nothing else, it, it, if they come away from this game 4-1, and one, beating the Packers, we'll definitely have to give the Bengals a much, a much harder look. All right. This wraps off the Off the Charts football podcast for week five. You can find our content all over the internet. Our Twitter is sportsinfo underscore SIS. Our articles looking at matchups and prop bet possibilities are up on Sharp Football Analysis. For stats, you can check out sisdatahub.com and check out the SIS Data Hub Pro, of course, for all your premium content. We've got lots more good stuff coming, so keep your eyes peeled for that. For Nathan Cooper, John Todd, and our producer, Justin Stein, I'm Matt Manicharian, and thank you for listening to the Off the Chart Football Podcast.